we're going to say that we're ready to begin. Are you ready to begin? All right. Deuson started yelling or something. This room is very, very quiet. <laughs> yeah. He's a ringer. He's my, he's my coworker. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, I am Karina Cizona. Uh, this talk is called uh, Converge Compute, Fast, Secure, or Cheap, Pick Three. Um, I am joined today by, uh, as I said, my colleagues. Lars Butler is also on the Zero VM team. He's an engineer on the team. Um, we are also doing a workshop immediately after this talk, and he will be leading that along with Agle Siegler and Cody Bunch, who are both from Rackspace Private Cloud. Um, so they'll be here as well. What we're going to do is the format is basically... Um, do the talk, then the workshop, and we invite you to do that. Get hands-on with the stuff that I'll be giving you. I'm giving the high-level overview of what this stuff is. Um, and then what we'll do is, um, in between, we'll do Q&A, so you can basically squeeze in all the questions about all the things at once. So that'll be kind of the, the middle between these two sessions. Um, so as I said, my name is Karina Cizona. You can find me everywhere on the internet as CCZona, except in my own Rackspace email, where it's karina.zona at rackspace.com. Um, they're special. So secure, fast, or cheap. We have gotten to an interesting point. Containerization is you know, the great new hotness, um, but it's also making some decisions that we either have to have secure or we have to have lightness. And that really puts us in a, an awkward position, right? We're making some, some hard choices as if we have to. And um, what I really want to talk to you today is about ways we can not be compromising on this stuff. We should be able to have both secure and fast and lightweight, and it would be really great if it's cheap, right? Um, so we, we can accomplish those things. Oh, I forgot to have a remote in my hand. OK, so what is Zero VM? Well, uh, it's a couple of different things. It's an open source project, which is sponsored by Rackspace. They acquired the AP last year and have continued to, to keep it open source. And uh, there's a, a number of team behind it at this point. I think we're 12-ish or so. Um, so it is, at base, a Technology for fast and safe execution of untrusted user code. Um, so there is the project, ZeroVM, and then there is the base technology, and that's describing uh, the nutshell of the base technology. So taking that down to some buzzwords, here are the key features. It's secure, lightweight. It's an application execution environment. Um, it's very scalable. And it is doing process level isolation. And this is something that we'll go back and kind of uh, go into more detail with. And the reason I want to give you this is to kind of plant in your mind how these things contrast with other related technologies in the same, um, same category. So secure execution. It is a secure execution environment. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, a couple of things. Knackle is a na native client. It was developed by Google uh, for Chromium. It is technology for isolation of uh, essentially server-side code uh, for execution in the browser. Um, so they've put a lot of their time and money into developing that. They've paid some tremendously large bug bounties. Um, we get to, you know, wonderful world of open source, just take that for free. Um, and we do. Uh, so the other thing Knackle is providing, it, actually two things. OK, so it's providing two things. One is that it's providing validation. So before code can even be passed off to zero VM at all, Knackle is doing the work of validating uh, whether this code is safe to run. Does this through static binary validation? Uh, and what I mean by that is that processes uh, cannot jump, they cannot communicate, and they cannot coordinate. If it violates any of these things, Chromium, I'm sorry, Knackle will not pass it off to zero VM. Um, the other thing that, that Knackle does for us is it locks down a number of syscalls. So Linux kernel has over 100 syscalls. Um, Knackle reduces that down to some sort of double digit number. And then what we do is we take that further. So zero VM is essentially a trampoline. So it gets passed off the application, assuming that Knackle has validated it. Um, and then what we do is we also lock down the syscalls further. So there are essentially at this point, um, not essentially, there are only six syscalls that are allowed within zero VM's environment. P read, P write, jail, unjail, fork, and exit. Um, so we're, we're creating deliberately a highly constrained environment. And that also means that there is deliberately access to very few resources. Um, if you want to do networking, uh, you can't. <laughs> um, th that's not the app to write for this. Um, 
If you want to work with file systems with persistence, you can, but only under a great deal of constraints, and you have to make deliberate choices about that. Um, we call it channels. This is your method for being able to make the choice to communicate with the kernel. And um, what we're basically doing is we're creating a virtual file system, an in-memory file system, and you can choose to specify a channel that is essentially treated as just I.O., um, and designate that uh, the application process can write to this particular designated channel. Um, but all of those are things where you're choosing to open up the security model. Uh, ZeroVM is really lightweight. Um, and when I say lightweight, people are always comparing it to other containers, and I'm like, no, 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 no. By lightweight, I mean, um, okay, let's compare to old-style VMs, right, to hypervisors. VMs are so fat. Right. They share resources, first of all, which is an exposure vector. Um, they're slow to spin up, sometimes as much as minutes. Um, and they're such a resource hog, and resources on a variety of levels. Right? I mean, they're using, they're using network. Their use of hardware is really excessive. Um, you have to pass stuff back and forth across the network in the conventional way that we're using them. Uh, and then they've got all this resource bloat, all this stuff that you really don't need for cloud applications for the most part. Um, so they're really not a great model for what we need to accomplish these days. Containers are the new hotness for totally valid reasons. I'm going to take a bit of water here. Um, they are, though, actually making, they're less secure, ironically, than VMs because they're opening up more surface area by sharing more resources. Um, so we're actually increasing that contamination risk. They also, while they're not as excessive as a, a VM, they're still using far more resources than are necessary. So we have excessive just in the form of less excessive. Mm. Okay, next one. So the typical metaphor for containers, especially if you think about something like Docker, which is the first thing usually that comes to mind for people when you say containers, um, the, the typical metaphor is a shipping crate, right? And you can think about the, what that metaphor implies. Things like stackability, right? Modularity, interchangeability, something that's really hardened around it. Um, zero VM, the better metaphor is something like an egg crate. It is about isolating those things. We don't care about how they stack on top of each other. That's not the important point. The point is to cradle each of those processes and protect them from the rest of the world and protect the rest of the world from them as well. So right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use containers in ways that they were not at all meant to. Um, and so, you know, we kind of do this thing of like, if, if I just spend a little time hacking this, I can, I can make it, I can make Docker what I need it to be. It's so close. It's almost there. Um, it, you can do that. <laughs> that, that's, that is a thing you can do. It is not a great thing to do. Um, zero VM, the kind of lightness that I'm talking about here is 75 uh, kilobytes for the total execu executable file. And what that means is that the spin-up time on this is about five milliseconds, depending on um, whether you execute in daemon mode or not. Uh, in daemon mode, five milliseconds is genuinely realistic or less. Um, if not, then like 30, 35 is, is a more realistic number. Uh, I do have to, to clarify that uh, those numbers apply just to zero VM. NACL's uh, validation time is its own uh, amount of overhead. And then, of course, your application, that's up to you what kind of overhead you're imposing. Um, but this is zero VM's footprint itself. So it's massively scalable, and in part because of this. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Back one. All right. So. I said zero VM is you know kind of a bunch of things. At its core, zero VM is just NACL plus the zero VM runtime called ZRT. And I hope that I've already run through some of the ways in which you get secure, fast, and cheap out of those. We're using a lot less resources. We're doing that very deliberately. You're going to have to make choices to use resources for the most part. Um, it's fast. It has extremely constrained environment. Um, you have to make a lot of choices here to actually lose those benefits. So because we have this lightness to benefit from, we can actually embed zero VM, um, and that includes inside a data store. And that gives us some neat opportunities, which Swift provides. Swift, um, you know, it's incredibly scalable, right? So it makes a nice, easy target as something we would want to be able to do fun stuff with. Um, it's got a great community uh, supporting it, and it's got an API. <laughs> 
So we use that API to create some middleware that basically um, marries Zero VM and Swift, um, creating some new functionality. So it's kind of extending the, the API and allows you to do stuff like um, map reduce inside Swift itself. You don't need to move anything outside of the data store. You don't need a compute cluster. You're doing that work on the storage cluster itself. Hey. Okay. Um, so that's the portion that is zero cloud, which is another part of the zero VM as a project. That's one of its pieces. So we have zero VM, the basic technology, NACL plus ZRT, and then zero VM, the technology with Swift via middleware is zero cloud. And that too is getting a lot of those benefits and creating some of its own in terms of that secure, fast, and cheap. So let's look at some of that stuff. All right, unfamiliar buttons, sorry. Um, so one of, the, one of the benefits you get out of this is um, because you can cross-compile executables for NACL, it means that anything you're able to cross-compile, you can then use essentially natively. And so one of the things you can do is use Python as essentially your querying language. You write Python apps to do that work for you, to do the compute within Swift. Um, so you could think of those as stored procedures. Swift doesn't have its own stored procedures, but you're getting stored procedures that you can hopefully use in the language you're using every day, right? Something that you don't have to learn this special flavored language of a particular data store. You're using knowledge that you already have. So let's look at some use cases for this stuff. Um, compute on cold files, we found, is incredibly useful application. Um, we had one example where we were given, um, OK, so like I said, we're sponsored by Rackspace, which means we get to work within Rackspace, which means we have access to uh, the obscene amount of data that is produced every day by a large cloud provider. Um, and so they gave us this, this problem of here's like tons of varying log files from throughout the company, and they're in all sorts of different formats, and they were just tossed into the data store, compressed. And what we need is to find a needle in a haystack. Can you do that? Because when we try to do that, it's taking a bunch of time to decompress the stuff, and we have to move it out to, you know, to some place to do that work. And it's taking five hours just to do any search whatsoever on this 7 gig 70, I'm sorry, 1, 7, 17 gigabytes. Um, and this was really just not realistic time. I mean, you're doing more than one search. Um, so we took that, and um, because of cross-compilation issues, we couldn't just run grep. Um, in zero VM, so instead we wrote a Python script that uh, essentially accomplishes the same thing. And this is a suspense moment. Um, and uh, so what we were able to do then is um, not only were we doing that search that was taking five hours with grep, but we actually were also doing the compression, uh, the decompression, uh, pardon me, um, in memory in zero VM. So nothing had to move out at all. So in that, that unfair fight of you know, decompressed files already available versus compressed files that have to be decompressed in memory, we went from five hours to three minutes. So that's the kind of speed benefit that we're talking about here. Um, next one, text analysis. So um, Project Gutenberg, uh, I assume you've, you've looked and noticed they have a lot of words. Uh, so we've done some fun analyses on some corpuses from, uh, from Gutenberg, we see a lot of potential there. Um, uh, image manipulation, uh, image manipulation, video manipulation. Um, we've had a variety of examples. You can do a lot of stuff that's sort of like image magic. You know, we've done things like watermarking, that kind of stuff, resizing, blah blah blah. Um, video, we had. Um, one that we are are doing very successfully is essentially screen capping. You can just take a a slice periodically out of, out of the video and just take an image out of that. Um, so you can do something that's a little bit like, say, somewhere between YouTube and Flickr in terms of just being able to do screen capping to represent what, what the content is. We had imagined that we could do um, live transcoding of video straight out of the data store. What we found is that that's really, really hard and it has nothing to do with zero VM. It turns out that video is really hard. Um, <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so there's a reason why there's a whole specialized industry just for dealing with transcoding. It's incredibly hard, and it would be really great to be able to have that kind of expertise on our team. We just don't. So it is something that we do have, we've investigated enough to think that it is, in fact, viable to do stuff like, okay, let's get all those mobile formats right at the same time. You need high resolution, great. We can, you know, feed all those out, whatever is being requested um, in the API, like, boom. Uh, but we can't accomplish it ourselves. So that's a great project if someone else wants to take that on. Um, that would be, I think, very viable in our minds. Uh, auditing. So there's so many fields in which you've got, um, you know, regulatory requirements, uh, some sort of compliance requirements, um, things like protecting uh, who has access to files or being able to prove, you know, the essentially the, the, the tracks back. Um, how did these modifications come? Um, the security model provided by NACL really gives you a, a lot of security guarantees on that, so that is a great opportunity. Um, we've also been approached um, by people interested in embedding in things other than Swift, including hardware. Um, manufacturers of SSDs have been really interested in, hmm, how can I exploit this idea of being able to, you know, have a little execution environment right there on my SSD? Um, we're not pursuing that ourselves as a team, but that is another one of those applications that you could look at. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. There was another one with the bad ability. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so antivirus researchers actually find this intriguing, right? The ability to really be, be confident in your isolation and actually still be able to do execution. Um, so there, there have been a couple of antivirus companies who have been very curious about, about what the possibilities are here. So those are the major use cases that we've looked at. I would also love to hear from you if you are thinking of something else that is potentially useful here. Um, we're really curious ourselves. So typically, as soon as you talk about zero VM, you hear, oh, you mean like Docker? Because a lot of the vocabulary is legitimately the same, and we are containing, but we're doing it for really different reasons in really different ways. Um, and so we've got this shared vocabulary that sounds like we're all talking about the same thing, and we're completely not. So let's run through it. Okay. So obviously, the isolation is built on NACL. Uh, Docker is using Linux namespacing. Um, Zero VM is, at its heart, an execution environment. Uh, Docker is about running isolated apps. Um, so the big emphasis, of course, on Docker, and one of the reasons why it's so popular is it's so easy. Ease of use is like right there at the top of their feature list, right? Um, we, we do not offer ease of use. <laughs> I'm sure that will be on Twitter. Um, uh, the, the model is really coming from like two different ends of the scale, right? Security first, we'll, we'll build on that things to make it easier. Uh, Docker is starting with the philosophy of easier use and we'll work on adding more security to that. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which we're similar, but we're coming at it from a completely different point of view. And that means depending on what your particular problem is, you know, one of these is probably a much better fit for you. This is not a matter of there's the right one and the wrong one. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, uh, scaling. So uh, they're both very scalable, but the difference is we're talking about scaling execution, that ability to, to um, scale processes uh, rather than, say, scaling deployment of apps. Um, so that's a really different scenario in which we're using these terms that sound like exactly the same thing, right? So in, in primary use, you're really talking about a production tool versus a deployment tool. And that's not to say that they don't have, you know, that Venn diagram overlaps some, right? I mean, obviously, many people are using Docker for things other than just deployment. Um, but those are, are sort of the primary context in which you see these tools being used. Um, the isolation, when, when Docker conversation about isolation comes up, it's usually about isolation of an app, right? Or, you know, um, what we mean is restricting access to everything else. Um, zero VM instances essentially have no, they're, they're isolated from the kernel. That's, that is the point there. Not to layer neat little tidy applications on top of the kernel, but to keep everybody away from being able to talk to the kernel. So very different form of isolation. Um, some of the strengths that uh, actually I didn't mention actually determinism. Uh, so it is a completely deterministic environment and uh, we'll talk about that also as a constraint on what kind of applications you can use with this technology. Um, Docker, ease of use, portability, right? These are all the things that when you talk excitedly about Docker, these are 
These are the reasons, right? Um, so because it's deterministic, executables are going to run the same way every time. If the inputs are the same, the outputs are going to be the same. And um, because zero VM is also single-threaded, it means at any given point in time, if the inputs were the same, you can count on at that given point in time, that process, to also be the same. So you can get essentially snapshots. Um, whereas the sort of sameness that you get with Docker is about things like server templates. Um, Isolation from the kernel, we've talked about that. Ease of use, we've talked about that. Um, there is no process reuse whatsoever. Nothing is re reused, unless you're talking about, say, something you persisted to one of those channels. Um, otherwise, uh, that process dies forever and everything with it. Um, that is not to say it's short-lived. The timeout starts out pretty small, but we did some math on, on the timeout. Uh, you can, if you want to, run a zero VM instance for 68 years, um, you know, depending on what your problem is. <laughs> Academia loves to run things for this long. Um, but yeah, so disposable, not necessarily short-lived. Uh, fine green metering, if you can spin up in five milliseconds and you're just executing a process, all of these processes in parallel, and essentially it's an infinite number of processes that you can run in parallel, it becomes really viable to be metering in milliseconds as well. Instead of in hours, instead of in seconds, we can really get this down. We talked about embeddability, we talked about parallelization. Um, zero VM is a much smaller project. We don't have anywhere near the kind of adoption that right now Docker and other containers like you know, LXE um, have seen. Um, and that includes you know, uh, institutions like Google and uh, Microsoft and, and Rackspace, New Relic, um, have really gotten behind the bandwagon of Docker and we're not in the same place in development. We're not as far along, um, but um, you know, we also have a lot of different hard problems that we're trying to solve. Okay, so if Docker isn't exactly in the same space, there actually are a number of projects that are in a much closer space that are a lot more comparable. One is Joyant's Manta. Suspense again. It's all a trick. Um, so Manta is a, um, a platform as a service. It is very similar to the attributes I'm describing. Um, one of the things that they don't mention is security. It is not you know, starting off with that foundation of let's wrap all of this in a tidy little bow of isolation. Uh, it is also a proprietary service. It's not open source. Um, so you're looking at something where it, it may be great, but if you need some flexibility on how you're using it, you're stuck. Um, Hadoop is, uh, you know, a lot of times when, when people ask me for like the one sentence, what the heck is this, you kind of go like, eh, it's kind of Hadoop-ish. <laughs> um, and, and that's fair, but, uh, you know, we are, we are in some respect, zero VM is the isolation, right? Zero cloud is that converged compute. So zero cloud is in many ways providing capabilities similar to what Hadoop could do, but there's a a number of differences, right? One is that zero cloud is not a database. It is merely uh, some glue between Swift, the database, and all the features that zero VM is adding to that. Um, there's also issues with um, ease of use, right? Have you, have you ever tried doing map? I mean, you can do MapReduce and Hadoop, right? That's the big selling point. Have you actually done it? There's a lot of pain, no? Um, Mongo, uh, if you love JavaScript, Mongo is awesome. Um, that's what I'll say. Uh, so I, I said there's constraints. There are a bunch of constraints. Most of them are deliberate. A few of them are just because of where we are in the course of development. Um, but let's talk about those. Okay, first of all, it's x86-64. Um, secondly, you have to be able to cross-compile to the NACL tool chain, um, and that eliminates a whole lot of things. So for instance, what you do have available is core Python 2.7 is the one that's been ported. Uh, you have C. We actually have a Lua port that, cro that passes Lua tests. I don't know whether anyone's used it, but um, anything you want to port is going to have to cross-compile, and that means any library with C extensions means you have to cross-compile each of it those and all their dependencies. And so it gets really complex, which is why we have core Python. But then if you want to use things like SciPy and NumPy, you're, you're kind of off on your own trying to make that happen because that's, that's a really hard port to do. Um, 
But surprisingly, there's a tremendous amount of, of work that could be done with nothing but core Python, and we've had a lot of people just say, like, I don't care, it's fine. Um, I'm still able to do all the number crunching that I needed to do. Um, so, but typically, you're talking about C, C++, Python, um, assembly, correct? Yeah, I think assembly. Uh, everyone's writing assembly these days, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, as I said, it's deterministic. That means that you have um, all the time and date functions are stubbed out. Um, it, I had an interesting conversation with the guy who does this. Um, so it doesn't return a zero. It doesn't return a null. It doesn't rec return a random value or a consistent value. It returns a constant based on, I think it's number of instructions executed at that point. Let's just say it's a number you shouldn't rely on for anything. It, is a, it, it does return values, um, but it, because of that deterministic environment, if you need randomization, the only way you can get it is by passing in a seed. Um, it's single-threaded, which means that your application needs to be as well, um, or at least able to handle being in a single-threaded environment. Um, right now, and this is the only one that's really not deliberate, um, MapReduce is limited to 1,000 instances, that is 1,000 zero VMs, 1,000 you know, executing processes. Um, we're, we're, we semi know why and just have to dig down and, and fix that. Um, and I wanna, I wanna be clear that that's not the same thing as, as file handles. Um, each of those instances can pass around a lot of file handles. Um, in theory, they can each pass around 1,000 file handles. No one's actually tried that, so don't quote me on that number, but um, a lot, we'll, we'll go with a lot. Um, so all of these technologies really, I mean, you know, I'm like doing the addition, right? The NACL plus ZRT plus middleware plus Swift. They're all building blocks. And the great thing about that is, you know, each of them has these benefits, you know, at least one, two, even three of this, you know, fast, secure, cheap. Uh, and that means there's a lot of opportunities to build and assemble all these things in different ways. We've, for Zero Cloud, you know, we've told you like what that particular line of combinations is and what we get out of that. But you can use them as different building blocks to doing uh, very different things. Swift, writing middleware, it turns out really opens a lot of opportunities. Um, the middleware that we've written essentially is extending the API, which means that you can either look at it as an example for what kind of adoption, adaptations you would like to do, or take advantage of it to extend further. Um, what I would really hope that you would do is we have recently started um, writing, I should say, Lars has recently started writing tutorials, and this is something that's been lacking for a while because it's been such an R&D kind of project. Um, and we're doing a tutorial, obviously, today, next. Um, and what I hope that, that you will contribute, if you're looking for something to contribute at back, is more examples for tutorials, things that seem relevant to you um, or that you think are really creative and interesting uses to allow other people to kind of expand their imagination of what are the possibilities with this. Um, so as I said, we're starting that workshop soon. And um, how much time do we have before it starts? How are we doing? Oh, great. Okay. So why don't you guys come up and they can explain a little more about what the workshop will be and then we can do Q&A for, for this and for that. Does that sound good? All right. I think well, I don't... Oh, there's a break in between. Oh, we have tons of time. All right. Hit me. <laughs> okay. All right. The mic's up here. Oh, you got one there too. Okay. Uh, can you describe how you can throttle uh, the processes, as, say, in a Swift model, if you have a bunch of these running on object storage nodes? What do you mean by throttle? Uh, make sure that they don't take up all the processing uh, uh, assets on the <laughs> computer. Go for it, server. yeah. There's a mic right here, Lars. Yeah. Does this work? Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. At the moment, the, the scheduling for the, the orchestration of the zero VM instances inside Swift, um, it's super simple and super naive, so you could easily just eat everything up. Um, so that's something that needs, needs work and optimization. So it's yeah. incredibly naive. And I should add to that, um, one thing I forgot to mention is that Rackspace, in addition to funding the project itself, is also funding a bunch of uh, research projects, uh, academic research projects, at the University of Texas at San Antonio. They have a cloud big data doctoral candidates thing. Um, and so there are a bunch of doctoral candidates who are working on various aspects of zero VM and uh, scheduling is one of them. That's one of those projects. So that's a couple of years of work being put into making the scheduler considerably less naive. Um, 
that's part of, of where the project status is, that it, that it is in R&D, essentially. Yeah. I have more questions. <laughs> Go for it. You do get two, yes. <laughs> um, on a process, say you want to parse a big file, and uh, what happens if it takes a long time and the HTTP request, HTTP request times out? Every, you know, you have load balancers, you have all these things in the middle where if there's no activity going back to the client, it'll just drop the connection. Um, what is like a process, or maybe if you can describe like how the life of a request coming in from a client and then, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Um, so first I want to just kind of, so here, here's what happened. Lars just inherited the zero cloud code base, like he's one of the new maintainers as of a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we're going to cut him some slack because while he knows a lot, he doesn't actually know that much about zero cloud itself. Um, <laughs> So he's been on, on zero VM, but that particular aspect uh, just so happens that the, the poor guy is going to be asked questions that he is not yet able to answer. So let's see if this is one of them. <laughs> so in, in terms of timeouts and the, the life cycle of an application, um, the, the only timeouts I have seen are the ones that are put on zero VM itself. So Karina talked about uh, how you can, uh, you can run these things for up to 68 years. That's actually a hard-coded value uh, in the configuration of an instance. Uh, typical values are like 60 seconds or whatever. Obviously, you'd want to tune that for whatever kind of jobs you're running. Um, so those are really the only timeouts I've seen. Um, probably, the, probably there's something else that would happen within Swift and the middleware. Um, I'd have to look oh. deeper into that, but but okay. yeah. no, that actually answers my question. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't you stand up so the camera can catch you? Okay, more people. Come on, I'm being blinded. You have to give some sort of like reward. Ask questions. Why do you have the suitcase there? <laughs> <laughs> Another do ringer. You have that suitcase there. I I already demonstrated that. Uh, we have T-shirts. <laughs> Not the red ones, I'm sorry, those are just for team, but you get lovely blue ones. The red but shirts are for the away team. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have many red shirts There's, left. <laughs> there is a reason why he just took over the code base. Someone else wore a red shirt. So can you talk a little bit more about the actual use case of why are you using the security if you're going to put it on with the data system layer? I mean, the data has to be secured on its own. So the question is, why do you need security around the processes running in the data store? Yeah, so if uh, let, let's say you're a service provider and you're running in uh, a Swift cluster, um, you want some guarantees that your various users can't talk to each other uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, you, you don't want them, like, uh, technically you could just run Python code right on the, the host within the, in the Swift cluster, but then you can uh -oh. do bad things. And Cody wants to say something as well. So it goes a little bit beyond just service provider stuff. Um, if you have a, uh, oh, up on the stage. There's a camera pointed at, at, the, stage. Up on the, stage. Yes. at the stage. Yes. Stage. Uh oh. Yeah, I, I think I, the yeah. Air comes <laughs> so um, say, you're, say you're processing large amounts of unknown data. You want to, to be able to work on that data without having it in. Is the microphone? It is. It's okay, y'all yeah, hear me because I can't hear myself. There's no like. You're good. Um, so large amounts of data that uh, are not necessarily trusted. You're acquiring them from somewhere, or you need to provide access to said data. Um, one of the most interesting use cases. What got me really interested in this is uh, uh, like the quantified self data. So mm -hmm. when I go and work out, I wear a heart rate monitor, I wear a power meter, I wear something that tells me my lactate threshold, and so on. And that's all really valuable data that I then turn around and upload unencrypted to a, a cloud service, right? <laughs> that's, we're still in early days, and honestly, I don't really care that somebody knows that I'm going to die of a heart attack in eight weeks, because that's probably a good thing, right? <laughs> Maybe they market some uh, some baby aspirin to me, but the the idea that we can turn around and uh, microsecond by microsecond uh, audit access to that data via these processes and allow you to run analysis or or operations on that data in a way that will not affect the data itself and cannot infect other processes and you know like so if I give you access to my data, your process cannot get access to his data, right? Does that help a little? So my question was, like, if you're going to segregate the data separately anyway, 
So you don't always. So you get access to something. He gets access to something. It, this is this is another layer in that model, right? And then not not everyone has the ability to do that. So um, if you're if you're collecting a a bunch of log files and you need to provide access to three different auditors, right? And they each need a different section of those log files, but you've syslogged them all to one centralized location. So you don't have the data segregated that way. You can still provide access via this mechanism. So just to give you a little bit of detail about how this actually works inside of Swift. So um, when Zero Cloud receives a request to, to execute some code on this data, um, basically you can think of it like shipping the code to the data. And then the middleware um, in Swift will figure out where that data is physically located in the cluster, like which file represents this data, and it will actually just give access to that file. So you need to, you need to and of course the, this, this node that you're running on has data for anyone and everyone else that has an account on the Swift cluster. So you want that process to only be given access to very specific data, and you don't want it to break out because it's just, it's just a process running on, on one of the Swift nodes. Does, does that kind of make more sense? Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so, so the middleware the middleware has a clue about um, permissions in Swift, uh, which which user has access to what data. So it it tightly controls. Um, what you doing there? So when it starts up zero VM, it has to explicitly declare which files it gets access to, and it will it will only give access to files which that user is authorized access to. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit in the workshop. Um, it's basically just a manifest file uh, that's, that's uh, fed into zero VM when it starts. It says, okay, so this process is gonna run this code and it has access to this, 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 and this file, and that's it. And so, and then it's so, so that's like the trusted part of the code. It passes execution off to the user code, which can be doing any sorts of horrible things you can imagine, um, but it only has access to those resources. It can't just, open a socket or it can't just go grab another file that it wasn't explicitly granted access to. Does that help? Cool. Back there. Please use the microphone. Well, for the sake of the recording, yeah, yeah they, they the recording won't show. It should be high for me. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps here, yeah. You can tilt it. You can actually, you can pull it right off the mic stand That's to hold in your hand. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, basic information, like step by step, how to use what that means because that's new for me. I'm not. That's a, a, a completely new concept for me. Where can I learn that from? Zerovm.readthedocs.org. You have the docs there, okay. And uh, another question is: in terms, of, have you tested like with very very big uh, 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 data size, like pentabytes or something like that? Does it work? I don't know of anyone that's actually done petabytes of data. Uh -huh. um, I, I can say a little bit about that. So some of the UTSA research projects are specifically on um, creating uh, data stores with zero VM for uh, processing big data. So I don't know what stage they are on that, but that is exactly what they're looking at is, is processing, processing way more massive data sets. That is not what we're doing. That, or at least that we're, we're not doing that part of the zero VM work. Oh, could you do that in the microphone again? Who are they? Who are they? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, UTSA is the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, there's a blog post that gives a little bit of information, and if you want to email me, again, it's karina.zona at rackspace.com, uh, or tweet at me, cczona. Uh, I'd be happy to give you more information about that. Thank you very much. More? Come on, there's always more. Ah. Sadly, you're going to have to go to the back of the room. <laughs> there we go. It's like Sunny and Cher. So you mentioned um, several times Hadoop and Mongo and other big data solutions. Do you see in your ability to bring uh, like uh, the code to the data, do you see zero cloud, the future of zero cloud 
like a building block for distributed databases because it's like a common theme for basically everything that uh, very high process and big data. That's a very good question, actually. Um, that's actually the subject of a couple of the PhD students at the University of San Antonio. So they're trying to uh, implement like a, a SQL-like query engine on top of this platform. So um, I would say right now, no. But that's something that, that people are very interested and in actively working on. You're allowed to ask questions, too, Agla. So I don't have a question, but uh, I would like to encourage everyone to stay here for the workshop. Uh, I promise you it's going to be really easy. At the end of the workshop, you will have, uh, you will walk away with a zero cloud um, on a USB key, and you will have applications running on zero cloud using zero VM. It's going to be pretty simple. We'll, we'll start from, from zero to, to cloud. There's something pithy there about zero to zero VM, yeah. Can you just put your slide with your email address, please? Yes, I will. Uh, what we can do is go back to the beginning, actually. Close your eyes if you have seizures. So that's the easiest way to reach me, is just via Twitter. Uh, or you can reach me at karina.zona at Rackspace. I'm sorry, the email address isn't there, but yeah, the spelling is. And you are welcome to collect your shirt on the way out. How does this even open? This thing is enormous. <laughs> and I have sizes in women's extra small to men's four extra large. So don't be telling me you don't ha I don't have your size. No, there's, there's women's extra small all the way to men's 4XL. So, yeah, men's start, I think, at smaller mediums. All the ones with the round collar are the men's. That's a, the V-necks are the women's.